Scripture out of out of the book of Luke. Okay, so I'm going to read here the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, "There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate.' So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who set him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And against you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And I'm going to end right there. Okay. And then I'm going to give you my witness. <coughs> so when I was uh, about 10 years old, my mom was a good Christian. And she uh, made us go to church, all of us as a family, my dad too. And at 10 years old, I was baptized in the Southern Baptist Church in Tampa, Florida. My mom, my dad, my sister, and me. I believed in God and in Jesus, but... You know, at 10 years old, I did not really fully understand Christ, and I did not fully understand the Trinity. Okay? My mom died of cancer when I was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, my dad fell away from the church, and I never went back to church until I was 19 years old. My mom had asked my dad to promise her to take us to church, me and my sister, and that's a promise he didn't keep to her. Okay? When I was about 19, I was out of high school. I had started to go to college and decided that wasn't for me. So I basically, I had three choices to go into the service, which I could have, to seek another job, which you know I wasn't very happy with the one I had right then, or to go and live with my grandparents, which they had asked me to do beforehand. And I decided on number three, to go and live with my grandparents. So I stayed with my grandparents for about a year, about a year, year and a half. And you know what? These are the same grandparents that were my mom's parents. Okay. And what did they say when I got there? You're going to church with us. At 19, I was like, oh, no, I don't want to. Oh, too bad. 
Okay, you're living here, you come to church with us. For a year, I went to church and I got taught about the Lord Jesus and about the Trinity and about the Bible, and I learned. You know, as a, as a young man, I learned. Uh, I left my grandparents, went back to Tampa, Florida, worked there for a while, decided I was going to go into the service, went into the service, got married, had children, got divorced in the period of eight years. Three, three kids, eight years, two terms in the service, and uh, my wife and children decided to go back up to where they were from, up to Syracuse, New York, and I was in Tampa, and uh, at that time, my dad was in Buffalo, New York, and he was uh, had, a, had a bar and a restaurant and another job. He was, he was running a business with a job, and he needed a manager badly. Well, it just worked out. My kids were in New York. My dad was in New York. They were about two hours away. Here's the offer of the job. I left the airport. I went up and went to work for my dad in a small bar and restaurant. Now, I know you're grown men, and probably each one of you knows what a bar is like. You've been in one sooner or later. They're not the nicest places to work. You see the worst people. You see the worst things. You're feeding alcohol to people. After six or seven years, you know what happened? I got a heart that was about as hard as that, okay? It just hardens you up. It just toughens you up to people's problems. You just don't care. You don't care about them. You care about you, basically. And that's about how I was. After that, I uh, decided I was going to go to college. I saved some money. <clears throat> You know, I was able to use some of the GI Bill uh, from when I was in the Air Force, so I went to the University of Buffalo for three years and went to winter and summers and got my Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. Okay, I went to work for some companies doing accounting, that's what I went to school for, several companies in Buffalo, and it was at this time that I met some people that introduced me to a brand new drug that I had never done before. Of course, I had done quite a few. And it's called uh, crack cocaine. It's a funny thing about crack. You do it, and you think it's nothing. And you do a little more, and you think it's nothing, and a little more. And but before you know it, you're doing it all the time. And you get addicted. And that's what happened to me. I got addicted to crack cocaine over a number of years. And while I was doing it, I met a young woman who was a party girl. And I fell in love with her. Her name was Teresa Campbell. Okay, and Teresa and I partied like there was no tomorrow. And I mean no tomorrow. She had a lot of money. I was working most of the time. So we had plenty of money. I weigh about 185 pounds right now as you look at me. I was down to 135 pounds. That's 50 pounds off me. I'm not a very, you know, robust type of guy. I'm not real big. I look like the walking skeleton. One of these guys you see here in Reading that you say, "Oh, they got a bad amphetamine problem." All right. So I had trouble. You know, uh, it's a funny thing. My grandparents loved me very much. I remember when they, I left Oklahoma, and my grandmother and. Grandpa came and they gave me a Bible. They had my name in it. Presented it to me. Given to me by my grandparents who loved it. So. Still had it after many years. Sitting in my apartment. I used to walk by it once in a while and take my finger, <laughs> run it over it, and go, you know, I gotta touch that thing. It's got so much dust on it. And the reason it had dust on it was never open. So if you're ever in anybody's house or you're someplace and you see a dusty Bible, go over there and take a handkerchief or something and dust it off. Okay? That's what you need to do because when you see dust on a Bible, that's what God hates. He hates to see dust on the earth. He doesn't like to see any dirt on his way. Okay? So, one day, Teresa and I were party. And she told me, you know, I believe in God but I don't believe in Jesus. And when you're doing crack, 
It's just like somebody would say, well, what do you what do you want? Crack? You know, they said, what that's crazy. What are you doing? Crack? You know, she just didn't understand when I tried to explain to her, high as I was, how important Jesus was. Didn't think she didn't understand it. Well, about a month later, Teresa had been in a car accident, so she took pain medication every day in sleeping pills. Well, that night she took too much pain medicine and too many sleeping pills. And after 12 hours, <coughs> she hadn't woken up. So I tried to shake her. I tried to pour water. I tried to get her awake, and then I noticed her lips were beginning to turn blue, mm -hmm. and then her fingertips. And that's when I called the ambulance. An ambulance came. They took her, and they took her to the hospital. The hospital was only a couple of blocks from my house, so I didn't take my car. Okay, I walked. In fact, I ran. I ran a couple blocks down to the hospital. It wasn't, it wasn't real long. You could, you know, it was probably twice the distance from here to the road, just about. So I ran there, and I remember getting there, and they told me, sit down, yeah, she's here. The ambulance brought her in. The doctor's working on her now. I sat there for about a half an hour, and they came, and they asked me to come to a room, and I sat there for about another 15 or 20 minutes, and then the doctor walked in. Well, I expected the doctor to tell me, listen, Teresa's had a bad go of this. She's taken too many pills. Because this wasn't the first time she had ended up in a hospital in the ER because of taking too many pills, pain pills, or sleeping pills. And I expected the doctor to say, she's going to be here with us for a few days. We're going to take care of her. you got to caution her about this. Yada, yada, yada. But that didn't happen. Instead, what the doctor told me was, listen, Teresa's heartbeat was irregular when she got here, and it got terribly irregular. We couldn't get her heart to straighten out and beat right, and it began to fail. We tried to save her, but she's passed away. So, I don't know if you've ever had anybody that you loved and cared in your arms, and an hour later, they were dead because I remember hugging her, trying to shake her and wake her. And now she was dead. <coughs> Poor Mia. You know, I left that hospital. I remember the doctor telling me, uh, the administrator and the assistant up front that takes the information. There was a closed door and you couldn't get out until you pressed the button and opened it. And I told her to open the door after the doctor had told me, and she kept talking to the doctor. And I asked her again, and she kept talking, and I said, All right, you're fine. And then I screamed, Open the door. And I didn't say it so nice. And the doctor ran over and he opened the door. Because he was scared that I was going to go through the door, and I probably wouldn't if it hadn't opened. That was the longest walk home I've ever had in my life. Two blocks. And I've walked some distances in my life. How many times I ended up on my knees on the semen, I can't tell. How hard I cried, I can't tell you that. But it was hard enough, and I know you cried that the snot was just run out of your face, down the mouth, begging the God, begging him to take Teresa to heaven, begging him not to let her go to hell. <clears throat> Hands extended on the sidewalk, pleading, begging, shouting, car stop, people got it, asked me if I was okay. What had happened? Could they help me? No one. And then, no one. When I got home, my knees, the jeans I was wearing were torn, and my knees were bloody. But along that trip, along the rest of that two blocks, I began to talk to God from my heart. And you know what I told him? I'm scared I'm going to be next. 
I'm scared the doctor's going to come and tell my dad and my kids that I'm going. Please help me. Please come and save me. Please take me back. I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for the life I've lived. Please help me. When I moved towards God that night, He moved towards me. You know, God changed my life. He sort of broke me like a piece of pottery that you throw down and it smashes many pieces. He picked me back up and he wet me and he began to reform me. It was a funny thing, you know. I understand God's peace to some degree. <clears throat> Because I cannot tell you that the next two weeks it should have been a horrible nightmare for me with Teresa's death, her children, her mother, me having to talk to them and everything that went on. But I was at peace, calmness, over, like I had never experienced before. I was actually peaceful about her passing. I love that woman very much. After the funeral, I began to read my Bible and pray to God daily, morning and night. And he began to talk to me and he said, you need to go talk to a pastor. That's what he said to me. You know what I said back? I don't know which church. I don't know which church to go to. With the, there's several in the area. And he just said this one. I remember walking down to that little Baptist church and Knocking on the door in the middle of a Wednesday. Wednesday at like 2 o'clock. Who would think the pastor would be there on Wednesday at 2? I knocked on the door. A little guy came. He opened up the door and I told him what had happened to me. And I told him I needed to speak to a pastor. And was the pastor there? He looked at me for a long time. And then he smiled and said, I'm the pastor. He took me in there. We sat down. Prayed for me. I told him my story. And he said some mighty prayers from the garden he was from. I remember me telling him one thing. I remember me telling him something's changed in this. And he said, what? He said, what? What, what are you talking about? And I said, I'm wet inside. He said, what do you mean you're wet inside? I don't understand. So I tried to explain to him. That I had been dry inside, like a desert, like a bone, like a, like just there was no wetness. And now there was wetness inside me, like a little pool of water, like a, like something that was wetting sand coming up and, and making a pool. And he suddenly he started laughing. You know, and you're sort of embarrassed when another man's just laughing at Jesus. And you're telling him, you can't laugh at me, laugh and slap his hand on the table, laugh. He got up to him and hugged me. He said, that's a good thing. He said, that's a, that's a sign that the, the Holy Spirit's in you, that your Holy Spirit's moving in that way. So it's a good thing. So, you know, uh, the Bible says that Jesus can give you living water. He told the Mary woman at the well, I guess that's what I was starting to feel inside of me, a little bit of that living water. So uh, I attended that little Baptist church, and it was it was small. And guess what happened? It's something I really haven't talked about. All the things I was telling you about about crack cocaine and marijuana and alcohol, cigarettes, they're all chains. They're all chains that the world wraps around, you, tries to pull you away from the Lord, with one way or another, and they begin to fall off. You. And one after another after another. another after another as I attended that little church. <clears throat> and I was thankful for the great prayed morning and night all the time. Read my Bible all the time. And then something very, very strange happened to me. Very strange. I want to explain it to you guys now. It was probably about two months after Teresa had died. 
I had been going to church for almost two months ago. It was a fall day, sort of weird. Up in Buffalo, you know, sometimes in the winter you don't get any sunshine. Or the late fall, you don't either. And this day the sun was, there were clouds, dark clouds, but they would part and a ray of sunshine would come down and just be brilliant, brilliant. And I thought, what a strange day this is. What strange weather. The sun looks so weird. And I was up in my apartment. My apartment is about as high. I live on the third floor of a big, big house. And it was about as high as that tree is out there, that big one. It's about 60, 65 feet up off the ground. I was walking from one room to another. So I had left the room here was in the doorway, coming into a hallway, and the other room was about right there. And as I came into the hallway, I looked up, and I saw something through that doorway as I stepped towards it. What I saw, I'll never forget. The day I pass, I'll still remember. The Lord showed me something that scared me almost out of my wits, and I'm not an easy man to scare. I saw the air start to shimmer a little bit. And I'm looking through a doorway at a series of windows, something like this with these windows. So in other words, it ran down the whole wall, about six windows. They were about this high, about this wide a window, okay. And what I saw out of that shimmering air was a beam came and appeared. Probably about this one. Had wings on his back. Wings you could see through, not wings with feathers. I could actually just see through them, but I knew they were there. Why? When you look at a hummingbird when it's flying, how do you know it has wings? You can sort of see because it's vibrating behind him, right? They're so fast, but you know he's got wings in him. So I knew he had wings too. He was the color of a new pen. No hair. Had a gown on, white, lighter than this paper. Had a small gold band, half the size of my little finger, went around his lower chest right there, completely away. He came out of that shimmering air very fast, and he stopped. I remember looking, just transfixed. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Stopped, never looked at me. He's outside the windows. He's just looking straight forward. Took his head. And he leaned it up like this. And when he did, he was praying. He was talking to the Lord. It lasted maybe two seconds. When he brought his head down, he was gone. And he was gone so fast that within 10 or 15 feet, he began to disappear. How that happens? I'll ask the Lord something. <clears throat> now, I know this is a hard thing for you gentlemen to hear me speak about and die for. It's a it is real as I'm standing here before you speaking. I'm a man of truth. I won't lie to my brothers in Christ about what I saw. This is to God's glory, not mine. God let me see something, and I don't know why, that was not of this world. It's of his kingdom. I got to look over the fence. 
这个头头骨啊。But I got to see it. When you see something like that. It scares the living hell out of you. I remember my dad had his offices on the ground floor of that house, and I went down. And I'm in my 40s. I'm in my mid-40s. And you show up in front of your dad, and you're crying. And he wants to know, What's wrong with you? Why are you crying? What's happened? And I was so scared, I couldn't tell him at first. He had to take me by the shoulders. Son, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's happened? What's wrong? And I couldn't tell him at first. And then when I told him, he let go of me and said, What the hell's wrong with you? What have you been doing? <laughs> and I said, Dad, I saw it. I was like a grown man, whimpering like a little child. And if you read in your Bible, a lot of times when angels appear, this is what happens. So what did it do for me? What did this do for me? Well, guess what? The strength of my faith tremendous. I know what I saw. I'll take that to the grave with me. And now you know what I saw. Very few people I've told this to. I haven't told you that. I've told this to a few pastors and a few close friends. You're my brothers in Christ, so I can tell you. And I can tell those people who are now will see this on YouTube. When this happened to me, I didn't understand it at first. <clears throat> But I have a little bit of an idea now. I've told you. An angel's a messenger. And guess what? There's one thing I can say for sure. I know angels pray. <laughs> okay. They pray too, just like we do. They ask too. All right? I also know that that being can fly. And he can move like a bullet. I mean, he can move faster than you've ever seen anything move. That's not a bullet. <clears throat> well, if you think this was easy for me to come and tell you guys this, it was. It's hard. I'm sure there's going to be people in the church that are going to watch this and go, no, he didn't see that. I didn't. I didn't. After this happened to me, I moved out of Buffalo when I came to Red. And you might say, well, why did you come to Red? Well, my sister's out here. She owns a business. Came out for the work. Glad I did. I was able to use some of that good accounting knowledge I got at the University of Buffalo to help her company. She, she had some, not, not when I first moved out, but shortly after, but she had some a really bad time. Really bad. You know. But the Lord's blessed her truthfully too, and I guess some of that, uh, some of what I learned in college uh, was able to help her. And the reason I graduated, I can tell you another story, is because of the Lord. Okay. Not because of me. So I met my wife, Colleen, and we started dating. You guys know Colleen? <laughs> she gets around, doesn't she? She is. She is. I'm the introvert. I'm the quiet one. And I really am, except when I speak. She's the one that's like a ping pong ball. She's everywhere. If you go to hit her, you miss her because she's over there getting struck by somebody else. Hitting her. She's just everywhere. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing about my wife. Except I'll tell you one thing. Don't ever go shopping with her. 
<laughs> she knows half the people in Ray, <laughs> and she'll stop to say hi. God bless her. <clears throat> so Colleen and I uh, dated, and we ended up being married at Cloverdale in Happy Valley. And I, I started my ministry there for a little bit for you know Juana with the kids and JV, and you know that's what the Lord set my heart to, and and that's a good thing. Okay. You know, and, uh, and uh, the pastor there found out that I could actually get up and say two words without stumbling and falling. Which I've almost done that when I've been speaking before. So I, I did a little bit of preaching there too. But I have to tell you guys each one of you has a witness. You've heard mine today. I've heard Jerry's over there. It's wonderful. It's hard. It's hard for me. How important that witness is. You don't think it's important. You don't think it has meaning. Me. Just to you, you think, but you're wrong. Each one of you has something to tell one of God's children to help bring them closer or to lift them up to the Lord. And that's the truth. Okay. So, you know, the Lord's still working on me as He's like He's working on each one of you. Sometimes you don't realize it. You don't think it. You think it. You've got a slow time. The Lord sort of we sort of forgotten about me a little bit and he's looking by it. No. He's working on it. Each one of us is like I like to call as the Lord's whip. You know what a whip is? W-I-P. Each one of us is a work in progress. Until the day we die, that work is in progress for each of us. So remember that. Remember that you work for the Lord. <laughs> What a wonderful policy he is. Wonderful. So, I've given you my witness about what's happened to me in my life as a young man about Teresa Campbell. And I think you saw it in my face and heard it in my voice that I loved that girl very much. And when she died, how horribly it crushed me. Just crushed me. And as I would think back in the first four, five, six months, I thought, this is probably one of the worst days, if not the worst day of my life, was no. No. Now, 10 years later, a little bit more, 11, 12. That day that Teresa died was the day that the Lord changed my life. <coughs> brought his son from his That day that was so full of sorrow, now God has brought joy to me. That day where I felt despair, I can now feel hope because of the Lord. That day that I hated, I now have a love for I can testify to you because of all these things. And I can testify that what I have said here this morning is the truth. I want you to know that each of you has your own testimony and how important each of you is to this church and to each other to help each other and to encourage each other in the spreading of God's gospel. I hope that anything I've told you this morning will uplift you in Brothers, thank you very much.